Signore e signori, buonasera, welcome to New York University, Casa Italiana Zerilli Marimò. Bienvenidos a nuestros amigos del Teatro dei Cervelli. They were rehearsing in my office, uh, when was it, Monday, and it was great to see the pieces building up around uh, the instruments around, uh, around them. And it was a mixture of Spanish and Italian in the directions that were coming and going. And I enjoyed it tremendously. I, I, I think everybody should be jealous of this experience of witnessing in first uh, person uh, the, how you build a, a show like this. As you know, today is divided into two parts. There is a first part. There is a round table discussion a uh, scholarly uh, event, and then at 6.30 there is going to be the performance, and all of this is part of uh, a series of events conceived by Professor Eugenio Refini, uh, Viva Voce, and this, I would say, is the flagship of Viva Voce, is the, the big thing. And uh, I love the, the concept and I love the way in which Eugenio organized this, this event to include a performative element that is supposed to bring in people from the outside, even that are not academically trained in early modern music. And at the same time, it provides before for people who are interested in the uh, scholarly elements, in the philological elements, in the historical elements, literary elements, a chance to really go in depth into uh, this fantastic music. Um, professor Refini is a professor here in the Department of Italian Studies and uh, he's also a musicologist by training. We are very fortunate to have him here in the department. And I have to say that on top of his fantastic performance as professor, and he teaches amazing courses that I, if I could, I would sit in all of them, uh, seriously, especially the one called Diciamolo. Drama Queens. Drama Queens. <laughs> we all encounter quite a few of them, so it's so much better to talk about the real ones, right? Drama queens are especially men, in my experience. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, very, very happy that uh, in, with this program that really brings together the two uh, specialties, the two expertise of Eugenio, and his passion for what he does, and the um, consistency with which, he with which he works. He trains students, he dialogues with artists, he entertains this relationship that really has helped Casa Italiana be more open and more forward-looking. So without further ado, we'd like to uh, welcome Professor Eugenio Refini. Eugenio. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Stefano. Um, Thank you for the lovely introduction and thank you all for being here in such a beautiful day outside. Um, and I'm really excited to be sort of launching this uh, afternoon of musical um, events. We have two things, as Stefano was saying. We will begin with um, uh, a more sort of scholarly uh, driven um, uh, event. But first I would like to very briefly uh, sort of uh, spend a few words of um, thanks because really I have to thank um, several people. I, I will be uh, as brief as possible. I would like to thank, of course, Casa Italiana and Stefano Albertini for really supporting this event um, uh, and with, for the enthusiasm they all put into allowing us to do it here. Um, I would like to thank the Department of Italian Studies, who is also co-sponsoring um, this, this event. Uh, further fundings come from the Dean for Humanities and Interdisciplinary Initiatives and from the Medieval and Renaissance Center. So I really, I'm really grateful uh, for this very interesting collaboration of all these various um, institutional bodies. Um, some names, Julian Zacks and Costia Kostic from Casa Italiana. Without them, it would be impossible to be here. But also Julie Canziani and Esme de Coster upstairs uh, in our department, uh, who have been extremely helpful throughout the, the process. Uh, the students in my graduate seminar as well, because we have been dealing with um, these topics for uh, the past couple of months. And this is part of actually what we have been doing in the seminar. So um, the discussions I've had with them um, have been extremely um, useful and important. Um, last but not least, I will say more about the musicians later, but I really would like to thank uh, this fantastic group of performers um, uh, led by my partner in crime, Andres Locatelli, um, Teatro dei Cervelli, 
uh, for this great opportunity of working together on a, on a corpus of fascinating materials. Um, and this will be the core of our second part um, of, of this event later today after an aperitivo. So, you know, uh, um, we will have a little moment of refreshments and uh, um, relaxation before getting to the Baroque cantatas. Uh, now, um, this first part of the event begins with a keynote or a sort of introductory talk uh, followed by a round table. And we are really very lucky to have uh, for these opening remarks um, one of the uh, leading scholars in the field of Baroque music, um, uh, Wendy Heller. Wendy Heller is the Scheidt Professor of Music History at Princeton. Um, her work approaches early opera from perspectives of gender and the classical tradition, among others. Um, she has a long list of publications. Of course, I won't be able to go through all of them. I just would like to mention one title, because it's really very important to many of us, Emblems of Eloquence, Opera and Women's Voices in 17th Century Venice, uh, which is really one of the key works uh, uh, for uh, approaching this fantastic universe of uh, early opera. Um, she's also the author of Music and the Baroque, uh, the editor of a recentish um, edited volume, Performing Homer, The Voyage of Ulysses from Epic to Opera, which we actually uh, presented um, online as the first event uh, of the Viva Voce series. So it's really nice to sort of um, get this conversation going. Um, and also her critical edition of Francesco Cavalli's Veremonda is forthcoming or already out? Forthcoming. forthcoming, but it's already there on the website of Baden Writer, right? So you can kind of... <laughs> right, that's good. Um, so um, her work has been supported by um, several um, grants, um, uh, Columbia's Society of Fellows, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Harvard University Center for Renaissance Studies at Villa Itatti, um, so too many to go through all of them. I will just um, uh, ask Wendy to join us here on the podium. Her talk today is going to be part of her uh, current book project um, entitled, and this is the title of the book project, Animating Ovid, Opera and the Metamorphosis of Antiquity in Early Modern Italy. Uh, and I'm sure that this will be really the best possible way to get into this discussion of early modern laments, um, voice, and uh, all the ramifications of this fantastic topic. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Heller. Thank you, Eugenio, for your kind introduction. And it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, and it was that event that we did online was one of those bright moments during the, during the epidemic where there was a sense of scholarly community and you made that possible. So I'm really grateful for that. And I'm, I'm humbled to be speaking about this with scholars. You know, I'm a musicologist. I feel like, you know, that far side cartoon with the, the, the elephant sitting at the piano and he says, I'm a piccolo player, damn it, right? Because I've got, here I am a musicologist and I'm talking about classical studies with, with great Ovid scholars here and with great Italianists here and all of this. So, um, so bear with me while I take a plunge into this material. But I look forward to our discussion. Animated ep epistles. At the conclusion of Heroides X, Ovid's Ariadne is presented in a decidedly undignified fashion. The reader has already learned how she has passed the time since she awakened to find herself alone in bed. She recounts Theseus' cruelty, greater than any species of wild animal, including those waiting to take her as prey. She describes her wanderings on the beach, her cries, her wild gestures, and the beating of her breasts. Sometimes she is still, chilled on a rock as stony as the stone on which I sat. And other moments, prophetically, she imagines herself as a wild worshiper of Bacchus. She considers the past, how she aided Theseus in his quest, and the future, his, um, his triumphal arrival in Athens and her probable death of an exile. Dying isn't as bad as, as waiting to die. And in the final lines, however, she brings the reader abruptly back to the present. And uh, you can look at this now. Look at me now, you can't with your eyes, but in your mind, clinging to a rock that's pounded by the restless waves. Look at my hair, loosened as though I were mourning the dead, and my clothes heavy with tears like rain. 
My body is shivering like a crop of corn swept by northerly gales, and the leathers traced by my quivering fingers are shaky. I won't base please on the help I gave you, as it turned out badly for me. Don't be grateful at all for what I did, but don't punish me either. Even if it wasn't true that I saved you, you have no reason for causing my death. In my misery, I'm stretching out to you over the broad sea, these hands that are weary from beating my mournful breasts. I'm sadly showing you what's left of the hair that I've torn in grief, and I'm begging you by these tears caused by what you've done. Theseus, turn your ship around and sail back here. If I die before you arrive, you'll take my bones with you. Her predicament is, is um, far more absurd than tragic. Ariadne writes as she clings to a rock on the shore that is pounded by waves, barely able to hold a pen because of the quivering fingers. There's a certain degree of disingenuity here as well, for we are constrained to imagine that she is both writing a letter to Theseus and stretching her hands out over the sea. How exactly does she do this? Where does she get the pen and paper? It's bad enough that her hand is shaking from the cold, but unless she's managed to find some waterproof ink, we have to assume that the letter, should it arrive, will be all but illegible. And then, of course, as in all the Herodes, there's the delivery problem. For she seems to expect that the letter would be carried by one of the seabirds that Ariadne imagines gazing out on her unburied bones. And if Theseus didn't receive the letter, as Laura Fulkinson's pointed out, what chance is there that we're going to receive it and it will land on our doorstep? Moreover, any sense of tragedy is mitigated by a vital piece of information that only the reader possesses, namely that any minute now, Bacchus will be arriving with his satyr, Selenus, and all that noise and fuss, and perhaps he is watching and listening even now. And as Alessandro Bacchiesi noted, the official narrative of Ariadne's story opens up a potential for irony as the author and reader conspire together in a manner that disadvantages the heroine. Thus, even as we sympathize with her plight and condemn Theseus' cruelty, it is hard to ignore the hyperbole and excess, the over-the-top rhetoric, and the hedonistic pleasure that the voyeur reader derives from watching this performance of grief. As I pointed out in an essay published several years ago, we see some of the same strategies in Monteverdi's Ariana. Will she really be devoured by animals? Um, when, if the fishermen and Dorilla are observing, listening, and commenting on her lament? How seriously do we take her suicidal ideation? In fact, Rinuccini heightens the irony even more by allowing Dorilla, in the passage I've highlighted here, to jump to the wrong conclusion. The lament is interrupted as Dorilla hears the tumultuous sounds of Bacchus' arrival, mistaking it for the return of Theseus. This struck me as the cruelest of jokes, rendering Bacchus' arrival all the more surprising and heightening the suspense. How quickly will Ariadne discard, Ariadne discard her grief to enjoy the union with Bacchus? A question that is posed as well, I would suggest, in Caracci's fresco, in the Palazzo Farinese, and in Guido Reni's painting shown here. I mean, what's she really thinking in that Caracci you know, fresco? Now, of course, we must necessarily imagine how Monteverdi set this. Do percussion instruments and cornetti interrupt the languor of the lament? What kind of sonic world did he create for Bacchus? Regardless, as in the reading of Herodes, Ariadne's lament, lament creates a kind of voyeuristic pleasure, a mixture of irony and empathy. This is what operatic laments do in much of 17th century Italian opera. They allow us to eavesdrop on misery that, regardless of the master narrative to which a given character belongs, is but temporary, a moment of misery on the heroine's journey to a happy ending. What Ovid perfected in the Herodes, and which would prove so useful to 17th century opera composers and librettists, was a whole repertory of rhetorical devices that could be used not necessarily to grieve, but to perform grief. Now, that is not to say that there were not numerous other antecedents for the operatic lament in a host of genres, uh, Latin epic poetry, drama, Renaissance epic poetry, and so on, Euripides, Virgil, Homer, Catullus, just to name a few, um, Ovid, Homer, you know, in, in the portrayals of such heroines as Dido, Medea, Ariadne, Penelope, and Phaedra. 
but I would like to propose that there's something unique about the epistle as a genre, the way that it allowed poets to ventriloquize women's voices and construct a kind of female subjectivity that was intrinsically performative, all the while containing them in the space that is controlled by a pre-existing narrative. The question then, I think, is not so much how Ovid's Heroides influenced opera, but rather how Ovid's epistle might help us better understand early opera and conversely, how opera might provide us with some insights into Ovid's heroines. So once a neglected and somewhat marginal um, um, proof of Ovid's apparent lack of gravitas or dismissed as a minor work by a youthful poet, the Herodes has been the focus of intense scholarly interest in the past several decades. And you know, the scholarship is so wonderful. I'm just, it's just been a thrill to to have this wonderful resource to, to call upon. Um, the, the range of interpretations attest to the richness of these extraordinary poems and the complexity of the questions that they raise. Are these authentic narratives of women's stories or are they ventriloquized by the author? Do they provide an alternative narrative to the conventional stories of our heroes? Or do they represent a kind of failure of female rhetoric since the heroines do not succeed in changing their fate or persuading the lovers who abandon them to return? Does the cum cumulative power of the letters erase differences and remind us only of their similarities? How credible are the heroines and what happens when they recount a version of the tale that seems to contradict the mythological record or have knowledge that they couldn't possibly possess? Uh, are of particular importance for our consideration of the relationship between Ovid's Heroides and early opera is the extent to which the her heroines, as we saw with Ariadne above, are contained within their own myths, each of them stuck. Um, uh, Bacchiesi, as I uh, notes in a, in a, I love this description, they're in this narrative framework that cannot be modified. Dan Curley, who considers the Herodes in terms of tragic theatricality, observes how the women, regardless of the genre from which they originate, are placed in, quote, eleagic spaces with boundaries resembling those of the stage. The women may refer to actions that have happened in the past or might happen in the future, allowing the reader to imagine some horrific events that happened offstage. This theatricality, too, is bound up paradoxically in a kind of stillness. Our heroines are rooted in place, unable to take any action beyond writing letters, which, as we know, is a pretense for the author who has been ventriloquizing them all along. So while, while the Herodes may have been somewhat marginalized in, in modern classical scholarship for a time, early modern readers and poets were nonetheless fascinated by the utterances from mythological um, heroines. The most famous of the early modern translations, ah, here we go, is um, the Herodes is uh, Remigio Fiorentini in Versi Sciolti. And we see here as well how the paratextual elements highlight both Ovid's role as a ventriloquist. And we can note um, suddenly, am I res suddenly hearing feedback? Should I step further back? No, that's not working either. All right, fine. Um, but I just want to point out some of these paratextual elements. So we have the argumenti, typical in, in so many translations of these sources. And here there's even a point you see shaded in where we say, where um, um, it's very clear to say that, um, you know, um, secondo che finge un video. That a video is pretending that she's writing a letter. So there's a self-consciousness about that. Um, and um, Remigio also includes uh, various um, uh, marginalia that provide commentary or fill in the gaps in the master narrative. And while the conclusions provide summaries. So for instance, in this summary of the Dido letter, um, we're reminded that actually Dido and Aeneas never really met, and even that was a fiction. So, so we're being kept aware of the kind of um, tension between the, the, what the letters are doing and the master narrative. Um, and um, here is another example of a, uh, of a contemporary translation. Camillo Camilli's edition in Terzo Rima simply includes an argumento at the beginning of each letter, but does not provide that same kind of extra commentary for the reader. 
Um, but where we truly see the influence of Ovid, uh, Herodes, and the link to opera is in the numerous imitations published in the early decades of the 17th century. Poets became particularly fascinated with the whole notion of taking on the voices of various figures from myth and history, imitating both the individual letters and the ones that elicited responses, expanding considerably the repertory to include Ariosto, Tasso, biblical figures, and other pe uh, figures from mythology and even more re recent history. So here we see Francesco della Valle's collection from 1622, which redoes the Herodes choosing characters from Renaissance epics. And there we see, you know, Geneva, Ario, Dante. Um, we have um, Antonio Bruni, Giambattista Marino's close friend and admirer, chose a particularly varied set of heroes and heroines, including, not surprisingly, a letter from Venus to Adonis, penned after she discovers that her lover has been captive by false, held captive by false Serena, and he did communicate, as I recall, with Marino about this before it was published. Um, Matteo, uh, Matthias Greitner's uh, engravings, a few of which are shown here, capture something of the absurdity of having the heroines write letters in these moments of high drama. And I mean, I, I love there's Venus writing to Adonis, and there's Cupid looking by, and Cleopatra, and I love, I love Amore trying to sort of pen a little letter to Sika. I think that's really special. Here are some others. Oh yeah, Diana to Venus. You know, I wish there were time to talk about all these letters because they're really, they're, really, they're really brilliant. So she's in the middle of bathing and then thinking, okay, um, well, maybe Actian's on his way, but what are the consequences? I don't know. And anyway, I think these are really, 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 really fun. Um, and um, we see a, a similar strategy with the Venetian poet Pietro Michiele, and I've listed um, some of the heroines um, and heroes in, in his collection. Um, th these epistolary fantasies were ideally suited to the kind of rhetorical games that were so integral to some early modern academies, such as the Academia dell'Umoristi and, of course, the Academia dell'Inconiri, um, the latter of which was particularly involved in the production of Venetian librettos. So we know, for instance, that Michele Penn was one of the authors of uh, Cavalli's Amore Inamorata. Sadly, no music survives. But I've given you here just one of several long monologues that CK has. Um, so you can, you can begin to see, I think, where I'm going. Um, I mean, indeed, opera was in some respects the ultimate act of ventriloquism and dissimulation. The heroine's innermost thoughts, fantasies, desires, regrets, and anxieties are imagined first by the poet, interpreted musically by the composer, and then animated by the performer herself. We take for granted the fact that Ariana's lament was imitated so often both in chamber music and opera, and we will hear more about that later today and hear it later today. Um, but it's worth considering why it was that this was such an appealing mode for female singers. Despite all the press the castrati get, and I don't resent that, really, um, but we need to recall that the invention of opera and modity coincides with the rise of the female singer, from Virginia Ramponi to, in Florence, Anna, and Mantua to Anna Renzi in Venice. And this is just a smattering, but there's really this whole genre of singer poems from Marino's poems about, you know, sort of anonymous singers all the way through to the volumes dedicated to specific singers. And this is happening in much the same period as these, this sort of obsession with the letters. Now, decades ago, I provoke, uh, decades, decades ago, I proposed that laments provided an acceptable mode for women on the operatic stage, where they were that much more threatening than on paper. It was for this reason I suggested that a number of the first operatic women were framed from the troublesome behavior exhibited by the ethnic heroines, substituting cursing and melodramatic sorcery with apologies, guilt, and a good deal of self-blame. Monteverdi and Rinuccini's Ariana, for instance, curses Tezio only to immediately withdraw that curse. Let's see. Ah, it's not coming out of the speakers. Can you hear? 
And so we see in, in, in this respect, um, Ovid provides an alternative path, a way at times to, to subdue a woman if need be. Um, this is certainly the case with Dido. Um, and we can understand, for instance, why Dido's Ovid, so ready to blame herself for all that has happened, to forgive rather than curse Aeneas, might have been an impor so important in the construction of Busanello and Cavalli's La Didone, even if the narrative of the opera owes a good deal to Virgil's epic. And I'm assuming you can hear, you can hear the music? Okay, then I'm going to play a little of this. Indeed, it was with this in mind that I've, I proposed that the Ovidian influence in Purcell's Dido can be seen, particularly when we look at John Dryden's translation of the Heroides. It is not hard to hear a relationship between the conclusion of the letter, Dido's concern about how she will be remembered, and the final line of Purcell's setting of the famous lament. cutting it off, but that's the way it goes. <laughs> um, once women singers became an integral part of the growing opera industry, the Heroides then provided an essential dram dramaturgical model for opera. What better place to put the unleashed power of the female voice than in a static contained space where the laments, like the leathers that never arrive, can do no harm. Laments, after all, were typically moments in opera where the action came to a complete halt, where stage spectacle gave way to a focus on the singer, her body, her gestures. I would suggest that for early opera audiences, the laments sung by the women on the operatic stage were seen and heard through the lens of the epistles, as well as in relation to one another. The web seems particularly intricate during the first few years of Venetian opera, where we not only have the revival of Monteverdi's Ariana, which must have seemed, it's got some additions, but super old-fashioned piece compared to the Venetian repertory, and of course, Cavalli's La Didone and Monteverdi's Il Ritorno di Ulisse. But if Ariana can write a letter clinging to a rock, then why shouldn't Andromeda, sitting chained to a rock, get a lengthy versi sciolti monologue? And we see here um, in the first opera, well, the, probably the first public opera in Venice, um, uh, Ferrari's Andromeda, there's, there's Andromeda al Sasso. Penelope's lament from Il Ritorno di Ulisse provides a particularly instructive example of the way in which the Herodes might have shaped the reception of early opera. Paradoxically, because Maldiverdi and Baduara's construction of her is so dissimilar to Ovid's. Like Ovid's Penelope, um, 
uh, Monteverdi and Badoraz, uh, Penelope is aware of the Trojan defeat, but seems to have or is willing to express far fewer details, focusing all more on the whole notion of return than the nature of fate and fortune. Her argument is not with Ulysses, but with fate and heaven. And as compared with their operatic counterpoint, Ovid's Penelope is a fount of information endowed with the same kind of ver verbal agility as her husband's. Scholars have pointed out some of the inconsistencies in her story, but there is no mistaking her eloquence, her cleverness, her self-awareness, and the swiftness with which she changes mood and tone to argue her point. It is all too easy, then, to conclude that Ovid's Penelope is irrelevant to Monteverdi's opera. But I'm going to suggest that reading the Herodes has taught us any number of lessons about intertextuality. In the same way that Ovid's readers were express, expected to understand his Penelope in relation to Homer, so too Venetian audiences might have recognized Penelope's lament as a variation on the letter. Would they have noted, for instance, that by beginning the opera with Penelope's lament, Badoaro and Monteverdi were also recalling the structure of the Herodes? If this is the case, astute spectators would have been aware of a point that Ellen Roseanne has made in a recent essay in the opera, in the volume we were just discussing, uh, our, our um, uh, performing Homer volume, that Penelope's virtue in the opera is at the expense of her, her cleverness, that Monteverdi and Baudoire repress her ambivalence, her doubts, eliminate her deviousness, all in the service of transforming her into an emblem of chastity. Baudoiro and Monteverdi might have crafted the Penelope who was more clever, more autonomous, more alert to the subtleties of her circumstances, less placid and less depressed, but they chose a different path. And just to refresh our memory. say thinking about this now all these performances seem so really slow and it makes me think that thinking through Ovid might also be a way to think about how we're actually performing these pieces and the kind of voice but that's that's a topic of a completely different paper um, so in closing I'd like to present one example where the uh, impact of Ovid uh, is especially palpable and that it shaped not only one of the heroine's monologues but the actual plot of the opera here I refer to one of the most popular operas of the entire century Francesco um, uh, Cavalli's Giazzone with a libretto by Giacinto Ciccognini Ciccognini, an experienced playwright with a vast knowledge of Spanish theater, used a number of sources in crafting this libretto. But what is unmistakable is the way in which the opera turns on the coincidence that Ovid builds into the Roides, namely that Jason, who has the dubious honor of being addressed by two of, of Ovid's women, finds himself caught in an, in an uncomfortable love triangle between, between the two women. Medea, with whom he's been sleeping for a year without ever, ever having seen her face, that's in the opera, and Hip Hypsipyle, who has borne him twins and seems to be carrying them around on the stage a good deal. So there's much to be said about how Ovid transforms Hip Hypsipyle into a lamenting heroine, uh, co-opting some of Medea's murderous rhetoric and endowing her with knowledge about her rival that she could not possibly have. But what for our purposes, which is most interesting, is the fact that the wrinkle in time that Ciccognini creates in the libretto by arranging for the, these three protagonists to meet has its literary precedent only in Hypsipyle's mind in Herodes VI. And this is this moment where, you know, what if by hostile winds you would have been driven? Oh, well, actually it does happen, and it happens in Cavalli's opera. Um, Jason and Medea are thrown off course by a chorus of winds, which actually brings them to Ezephilis' shore. Thus, the imagined confrontation that seems merely to be a part of the ravings of a, of a, of a very angry woman in the letter, and a letter the recipient will never receive, is animated in Cavalli's opera. 
Ezephile performs what is essentially a letter to um, a letter to Jason with ex absurdly exaggerated rhetoric, using every musical lament trick in the book. Um, and just a few quick excerpts. The blue passages is the moment where she's going to beg, beg him to kill her. <laughs> hard to cut her off because she's just going, but this is an extraordinarily exaggerated sense and she really think he's going to kill her. Mm, I don't really think so. Then she's going to plead with, um, with, with um, everyone else assembled. That's slightly different, so it's not quite you know, a, a, a complete monologue, but one of the things she's going to plead is that, go ahead and kill me, but make sure that my breasts are preserved so that my children can continue to nurse from me even... <laughs> You know, it's over the top, right? And, and you know, and especially when Medea's in the room, right? The whole kid thing gets a little dicey, right? So, um, <laughs> here's this section, and here, this is ha handing up a sign: lament if you did, if you missed it, right? I had to wait for that last flat third. I just couldn't. I just couldn't go on. Um, and, and you know, this is interesting because it's dead serious, and yet is it right? I mean, this is this point. And so then, finally, her um, her final strategy is she's going to say goodbye to everybody. Adio terra, adio sole, adio. Have you ever heard that line before? You have to think she's really pulling out the language of Monteverdi's Orfeo. You know, adio, but instead of going to the underworld, she's staging. It's it, it's exaggerated, right? It's not just adio terra, adio sole. Adio, 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 adio. In the interest of time, I will stop. So what is so remarkable here is that she, the leather succeeds. Jason says, okay, I can't take it anymore. Good, come back. They get together. Medea and Aegeo get together, and we have this happy ending, right? I mean, Jason responds to the missive, returns to the woman he abandoned, and so it has an effect, her letter, her monologue, has an effect that Ovid's Hypsipyle could only imagine. Yet the spirit here, I would suggest, is remarkably Ovidian, for in creating a seemingly absurd happy ending, in which Azifale returns to Jason and Medea joins with Aegea, Cavalli and Ciccognini showed audiences how much fun it was to play with the master narratives, to encourage the spectator to imagine, for instance, an outcome where Medea does kill her children or maybe doesn't kill her children, right? It's like the moment at the end of Heroides 12 where it's like, she thinks, oh, I'm going to do something violent, but we know what's going to happen, but do we, right? Um, and um, I think, and this is also a world in this particular opera where the women's voices are genuinely heard. And I suspect Ovid would have enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Wendy. <clears throat> and, you know, I, I knew that this would be the best way to begin our conversation. So um, save questions for Wendy. We are transitioning into the round table right away. Um, so I will ask our um, speakers in the round table to slowly approach the stage while um, our assistants will put the chairs um, over here. Um, so the round table will feature nine speakers. Um, each of them will give a very short, you know, sort of um, presentation set of remarks. Uh, and after that, we will have an open conversation, of course, including questions um, on uh, um, Wendy's great um, talk. Has so many ideas already for us to think about. Alessandro Barchiesi, who is professor of classics here at NYU. Um, professor Shane Butler from Johns Hopkins University, also a classicist. Uh, Dr. Ida Cagliazza, who's a postdoctoral Marie Curie Global Fellow here at NYU and at the University of Oslo. Um, Dr. Jacqueline Horner Quayitek, um, um, who's on the performance faculty at Princeton University, uh, where she teaches voice, um, but she's also um, with us here at NYU Steinhardt. Um, Dr. Andres Locatelli, um, who's um, my, as I said, partner in crime for this event, a musicologist um, and also a performer, uh, and the artistic director of the group Teatro dei Cervelli, whom we'll hear later today. Uh, Dr. Jessica Peritz, uh, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Music at Yale University. Jane Tylus, uh, who's professor of Italian and comparative literature at Yale University as well. Uh, and finally, our W's, uh, Dr. Uh, Elizabeth Weinfield, uh, who's on the faculty at the Juilliard School. She's a musicologist, but also a performer and the artistic director of the ensemble Sonambula. Um, and finally, Dr. Emily Wilburn, who's an associate professor at CUNY, but also at the Gardet Center and a specialist um, of early opera and many other things. So really, I would like to um, leave the floor to the um, presenters, sort of five, five-ish minutes um, each, and then we will uh, move into a broader discussion. And we have three mics, so we'll just uh, move them around, and you can then have them back. So, a round of applause for our <laughs> Thank you, Eugenio, thank you all for inviting me. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for this inspiring paper. Um, I. I'm going to perform, uh, I'm not a performance critic, so I ask the advice of one of the best experts on performance, Hamlet. Uh, this unfortunately requires me to uh, perform a few lines from Hamlet, but this is like a sacrifice that I offer to <laughs> my friend Eugenio. But you're lucky that I'm not singing, so it will be <laughs> just reading. So Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are out, and now I am alone. Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that a player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so, so to his own conceit that from uh, her working, all his vis visage went, tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting what forms his to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him? This is the point that I need. What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for the passion that I have? And so on. So this is Hamlet as frequently on stage deciding what to do, and I think it's important that the confrontation with Hecuba and her suffering is uh, so central to the plot of Hamlet. He's trying to decide what, what to do, but I am impressed that it is not authenticity that matters to him. It is having to confront the lament of Hecuba by a player uh, on stage, by a man. That actually provokes Hamlet into uh, a decision about, uh, about his grief and the decision to test people's grief about the death of his father. So the situation is a powerful indication that um, the classical mythology of lament is kind of able to pierce through many walls in, and, and create communication and emotion. And again, it is not authenticity that matters. This is the striking thing that we learn 
uh, from Hamlet. Uh, I am fortunate that I have one pupil who is uh, an actor and director, and he has experience in staging Hamlet, uh, Mal Main. And he told me that this episode, the confrontation with the very absent Hecuba, is actually crucial to the plot of Hamlet and crucial to decisions that people make, you know, in theater companies on how to stage it. Um, this confrontation with this very far off character who is uh, played by a man, old, Greek, not even Greek, she's Trojan. So this sense of distance, um, in spite of that, is um, pierced by the communication through performance and voice. Now, if you look at my field, classical studies, uh, one of the best books that we still have about uh, some kind of continuity um, from antiquity to the present is the old book by Margaret Alexiou, The Ritual Lament in the Greek Tradition. And this is one of the few books that is actually able to bring together Homer and the real woman from the money in the 19th century. Uh, she has an impressive passage about uh, a woman from the money going to a tribunal to lament and protest the death of her son, bringing a knife. So she shows a knife and performs, is this a lament or something else? So in any case, uh, my advice if you want to look at the, the classical tradition is to view uh, women's lament as a place of resistance. Uh, it is a place of interruption. It is a place of not normal. Uh, because every ancient genre has a moment of uh, crisis when it comes to women lamenting. So, so in epic, in tragedy, there are so many examples. Um, Dido in the Aeneid, she will also come up in other papers. Uh, Juturna in the Aeneid, she performs a lament for her brother. And she also claims that immortality is uh, um, unhappiness. So she's basically not only protesting the death of her brother, she's saying that the whole apparatus of epic doesn't make any sense because it is based on a certain idea of immortality. Uh, Juturna is voicing um, Epicurean criticism of, uh, of Homeric epic at that moment. So those are all moments of resistance, which are also uh, resistance in terms of time, because time is now being conceived as circular, not um, straightforward or teleological. And this tradition begins with uh, my second uh, performance, unfortunately. It goes back to um, Cassandra in Aeschylus, Agamemnon. And the interesting thing about Cassandra is that she problematizes a number of things about theater when she performs her lament. It is not even clear whether she's going to speak or not, because some people think that you know, she starts as a, as a mute uh, character. And then she speaks, and it could be a lament, but is it a lament or not? That's what she says. One last word for a funeral, but is it? Urge. One last song for my own. I pray to the sun, the last sunlight I'll ever see, Adio Sole, that those who will pay for killing him pay also for me, for killing me, slave girl, unarmed, defenseless, alone. So in this episode, we see how lament always have a potential for subversion, and I think one of the things that we may want to discuss is how this potential um, comes up or, or maybe is under control in various uh, historical situations. So I'm Shane Butler, classicist with a B number two. Um, that was serendipitous. Uh, so I, my brief from Eugenio, if I understood it right, I hope I got it right, was to speak for five minutes or less about how my broader work might answer the theme of early modern lament. Um, so I'll be very quick about that. Um, the voice has been uh, central to much of my work, uh, from my earliest work on uh, Cicero's speeches as records of his voice, not just of his words, to a book project I'm working on now on Stimmung and atmosphere. Um, acoustically constituted in some ways. Uh, and I'd say that there are two 
elements that, uh, in, in that sort of continuum that strike me as having particular, um, you know, as, as rising into a particular kind of relief around early modernity. So in sort of theoretical terms, my work on the voice has largely been a part of a larger set of theoretical projects of pushing back against um, what I regard as the more pernicious effects of the 20th century's linguistic turn. Um, and in terms of voice, that has largely consisted of specifically pushing back against um, some of the ways in which voice has been conceptualized in criticism informed by psychoanalysis, and particularly by Lacanian thought. Um, so some of you may know the work of Mladen Dolar, uh, A Voice uh, and Nothing More, a very influential in voice studies, a wonderful book, and Dolar is a brilliant thinker, but someone whom I try to resist. And in a very short nutshell, um, my argument against someone like Dolar um, has to do with a kind of basic Lacanian premise um, that those of you who know Lacan will know, and if you don't, it is much more complicated than what I'm about to say, but this is it in, you know, ten words or less, that, um, you know, we're trapped in a world of language and things like language, what Lacan calls the symbolic, that trap fell, sprang upon us uh, in infancy. We can't even remember when it happened. We can't think back to before when it happened. We imagine that we can. We reach for something outside of language and language-like things, what Lacan calls the real, but we don't really have any access to those memories or to any such thing. That is just a negative projection out of the world of language, right? What is not language? Well, it's that real. And the voice for someone like Dolar is a perfect example of that, something that doesn't exist, something we want to exist, what Dolar calls a structural illusion that I think his exact words are, you know, could cure the wound of culture. Um, and I, I, don't, I don't believe that. I think there are some commonsensical ways to resist that. But I mean, I think we also have to be rigorous with uh, thinkers as rigorous as someone like Dolar. And my sort of very quick answer is to say usually that fine, fine, within the world of language, within the world of the symbolic, um, there is no real. Language can't contain the real or provide access to the real. But what we're forgetting is a loose end, which is that there is a, what I call a real of the symbolic, that the actual material presence of language, which does not actually exist except for someone like Plato, whom most of our 20th century giants claim to be resisting, um, there is no such thing as language that doesn't have that materiality. And so any access to or through language by necessity is a kind of engagement with something that maybe is in fact that very thing, and that the voice may mark that engagement. So that's like, theoretical strand one. The other strand in my work, a little bit more narrowly classical, although with strong connections to opera, especially in my book, The Ancient Phonograph, is about um, the way in which um, art forms like ancient tragedy, Greek tragedy, and opera um, seem to be staging precisely the voice as something not only beyond language, but even to some extent beyond music in some narrow conceptions of what music might be. Um, and, and that that leads me to a kind of, you know, you can, you can come up with a kind of weak version of that assertion, which is that we have to pay attention to the voice when thinking about ancient Greek tragedy, which was a musical form, and obviously we have to think about it in terms of opera. Um, but the strong, the strong version of that thesis, which is the one that I prefer, is that, you know, if we really wanted to make the voice an object of meditation um, and aesthetic um, concern and excitement and enchantment, um, and we went out to invent an art form that would allow us to do that, we would invent Greek tragedy and opera, that they are consequences of the voice. And they're consequences of the voice in a very particular way, not exclusively, but kind of overwhelmingly. It's the expressive voice that is expressing because it is being impressed. It's the voice of a body under pressure the voice of a body in physical or mental pain that is making sounds that language cannot convey, but that performance actually not only activates, but frames, right? And why would early modernity be really interested in those two things? Well, the second part of that is probably obvious to all of you, right? Um, but the first part is maybe, you know, no less obvious, which is that that early modern encounter with language, with multiple languages, the kind of bilingualism that Eugenio works on, the manuscripts in which ancient texts are being rediscovered, the textual cruxes that are plaguing the humanist. You know, language is never not material. It is overwhelmingly a thing 
for early modernity. And I think for those reasons, that lament, that expressive lament, and that language pushed into the most ineffable expressiveness of matter are distinctly early modern concerns. And so it's not a surprise for someone like Eugenio, who's listening to this kind of thing, to really settle, I think, on that intersection. Um, so I'm looking here, forward to hearing more about that from the others. Who's next? <laughs> Thank you. I'm Ida Kayatz. I'm the C. So um, I will start by quoting Virgil, Aeneid, Book 4. Um, so I'm also performing in English. But Sweet relics, this is the quotation, sweet relics, sweet while fate and the gods allowed. Take my soul and release me from sorrow, end of quote. So this is Dido, referring to the bed she shared with Aeneas and speaking seconds before killing herself, surrounded by a funeral pyre. In Renaissance Italian courts, these verses and the following few ones, Dido's last words, were often set to music and were among the most uh, famous Latin songs of the time. Baldassar Castiglione, the author of the Book of the Courtier, must have had in his ears one or more of the very moving versions of this song in the years 1503-1504, when he wrote a Latin elegy describing a musical performance of the song and quoting its lyrics, Virgil's verses. Castiglione's elegy opens on Virgil's verse, sweet relics, etc., the beginning of the song that brings along the memory of the whole piece, words and music, and then specifies that the song is sung, sorry for the bisticcio, uh, by Elisabetta Gonzaga, Duchess of Urbino, while playing her lamenting lyre. So Castiglione's poem stages a musical performance of Dido's Lament by Elisabetta Gonzaga. In this context, Elisabetta is called Elisa, Dido's other name. Ancient Carthage overlaps with Renaissance Urbino and three voices intertwine. Virgis Dido or Elisa, Castiglione's singing Duchess Elisa Betta, Betta in kind of brackets, and of course uh, the poet Castiglione himself. The singing duchess is depicted as a new Orpheus. Jupiter comes down the sky, and all nature stops to listen to her pious words. Pious words are a key element, we'll see. And human listeners, I quote again, are so profoundly taken away that their souls slide away from their chests, forcing them to cry, end of quote. If you read uh, the program notes of tonight's concert, you'll remember that this deep reaction is exactly the same that Arianna's lament elicited in 1608, according to Follino, that Eugenio quotes. So going back to Elisa Betta's performance of Elisa's lament in 1503, Castiglione says that everyone uh, in the palace has been enchanted, gods, nature, and mortals. The only one who is not moved is Aeneas, who is uh, at this moment kind of conjured here from the dead. Aeneas is the only one who can listen to Elisa's pious words, again, pious words, with dry eyes, without crying. And therefore, he is called a savage. But, uh, Castiglione says, Aeneas only had the chance to listen to Elisa's words, not Elisa Betta's singing. Castiglione says, I quote, the fact that, that these words are so moving does not depend from the words, rather on the singing of this new Elisa. If Aeneas will listen to her singing with such sweetness, he will finally cry and lead his fleet back to the African shore, end of quote. So this poem seems to be stating precisely what, as Eugenio says in his scholarship, will happen in the literary musical tradition of the 17th century mode of the lament. Verbal utterances of lamenting characters seem to be powerless. What makes them powerful, emotionally powerful, is the performance. Pure sound, body language, nonverbal utterances that only music can convey. I'm quoting Eugenio here. In Castiglione's elegy, it is remarkable that in a humanistic context, the experience of the moving power of music that the poet must have in his background annihilates the reverence for the classics and the trust in words civilizing power. Because Castiglione implies that 
Not even the great Virgil could have come up with effective words, pious enough to turn the savage Aeneas into a civilized and empathetic one. Dido's words, he says, are pious. So they should be able to speak to Aeneas, who is precisely the pious hero per excellence, if words had at all the power to move the soul, which they haven't, clearly, not even in Virgil's hands. So I thought this might be an interesting and early example of how performative memory can shape a text in a double way. On the one hand, performative memory elicits broad reflections on the relationship between text and music, giving birth to a theoretical, metapoetic text. On the other, a performance featured in a text B, Castiglione's Elegy, conveys a peculiar reception of a paradigmatic text A, Virgil's passage, here, uh, intermediality and intertextuality are combined, and uh, it's the performative memory that reshapes as a lament a text that is technically, I think, not a lament, as Virgil's verses are a tragic heroine's suicidal farewell, not the lament of a woman in love. In these verses, arguably, I think, and, and I'm curious uh, about what you think about this, Dido pushes away the elegiac temptation and embraces her tragic role. So thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hear your thoughts on Castiglione. <laughs> Who's next? I'm not, not sure how we're passing down, but I'll, I'll, just, ta I'll just take it. Um, hi, so um, my name is Jacqueline horner Quietech, and I am not a musicologist, nor am I a scholar. I'm a singer. <laughs> I feel like that, um, that elephant with the piano one you were talking about. I feel like I've been surrounded by pianos, but there's no piccolo in sight. Um, so uh, I'm an ex-member or former member of Anonymous 4, and now I have my own ensemble, Modern Medieval Voices. And I teach voice, as, as you said, um, at Princeton, and I also run some vocal ensembles there. So I approach this subject from the point of view of a performer and of an educator. And... Um, one of the things that I've always been interested in in my work with Anonymous 4, but also my work as a soloist, is bringing early and new together. And um, to, to the extent of commissioning composers and giving them a chant by Hildegard of Bingen and saying, use this, find, find something in this that speaks to you and create your own uh, piece based on it in some way. And... Um, I think that when it comes to singing anything, whether it's a lament or anything else, what we have to do is take the tools that the composer has given us and sometimes take what they haven't given us, what they've left out as much as they put in, and find our own voice. I have never been um, a performer, an anonymous word definitely was not when we were uh, together, uh, the approach of trying to recreate the past. I, I really don't know how, how we do that, really. Um, but bringing the past into the present is, is what interests me the most. Um, you know, the voice is, of course, unique. We all have a voice. We all have a unique voice. But we're united through the commonalities of vocal expression. And what's especially interesting is expressing emotion without words. We know just by hearing somebody, when they cry, when they laugh, when they sigh, that they're expressing an emotion that we can relate to. But then there are shades of emotion within that. If you hear someone crying, they may be crying because they're sad and grieving, but they might be crying because they've laughed so much that they've started to cry. <laughs> And equally with um, with cry, you know, with with laughing itself, there are all different reasons why we laugh, and um, we can be laughing at someone. So the laugh is spiteful. We're laughing because somebody told us a funny joke. We're laughing out of politeness because we didn't think the joke was that funny, but we laugh anyway. We are, we relate off these sounds to each other, and when we have text on top of that, then that's another layer of meaning. As singers, when we create characters, uh, we, our job really is to use these tools and interpret them in our own way. The text is paramount. The text that has been chosen, how to communicate and interpret it, is absolutely at the top of the list for us as singers. And the composer gives us 
their, uh, the tools. Again, as I've said, um, how is it set? Do they use word painting? What about the range and the tessitura? Two different things, by the way. Range is the highest note you can sing to the lowest note you can sing. Tessitura is where it lies. And frequently, you will find a piece that will lie deliberately at the top of one's range to evoke emotion, to evoke intensity that you're not necessarily going to get if it's in the more comfortable part of the voice. Word or phrase repetition, syllabic versus melismatic setting, the melodic contours and the rhythmic figures, the, the tempo. Uh, the, I think Wendy was, was saying that laments tend to be sung rather slowly. What happens if they're sung quickly? Do they turn into mad songs? It's one of my theories, by the way, because <laughs> grief and being driven mad by grief, it's, it's really all there. And you'll definitely change the context and you'll change the mood of something simply by singing, trying to sing it at a different speed. What else do we bring as singers? We bring our vocal color. As I said, we all have unique voices and we all can use our voice in different ways, the timbre of our voice. And of course we can, if it's appropriate, elaborate on what has been given, embellishments, ornaments, trills, all sorts of things that are definitely the tools, they're all in the box that we can use. But also sometimes we're actually asked not to use them by composers. I'm, I'm interested in, in what the composer, if the composer has ever actually said anything about, if there's anything in writing about what they might want the singer to convey. And to use two very famous examples of laments, um, Gluck's Che Fauro Senza Euridice. One of the challenges for a performer um, singing um, the, the lament, you know, the loss of the, of the beloved Euridice is the fact that it's in C major. Something that sometimes we don't think about. So it's a lament in a major key. Apart from I think there's a little moment it goes into minor, but it's essentially in major. And I believe the thought process behind that from Gluck was, as the reformer, was to use a major key as a way to kind of say, you know, slow your roll singers. Um, you can't take this and elaborate on it and do theatri theatrical vocal gestures and all. You have to take it simply and use the fact that it's in a major key to bring the inner turmoil out. The, the major key is, is basically your inner hope. The hope is not entirely dead, even though it, it's, it's one of those stages of grief, right? Denial, the hope that maybe things aren't the way that they seem. And that's what, to me anyway, that's what the major key does in that piece. Even as you're mourning the loss, there's something in you that's hoping that you're wrong. And you will obscure that as a singer if you take what, what is written and, and change it. There's a couple of passing notes that singers put in. We're, all, we're human after all. But, but essentially, it's the simplicity that, that the composer asks of us is something that we have to honor as a performer when, when we sing that piece. Um, another piece, very famous lament, of course, is Monteverdi. Monteverdi's Lamento della Ninfa, which I have sung uh, many times, including one with my colleague down at the end there, Elizabeth Weinfeld. Do you remember we did the Lamento years ago? It was a long, it was years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's a wonderful example of the composer, again, the inner voice. I always like to talk about a piece as a heartbeat or an inner life to it that's represented usually by the accompaniment. What you're not saying out loud, the accompaniment is saying for you. And of course, we have what I like to call a lament descent. In the um, in this in the Monteverdi piece, the bon, da 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 da, it's relentless in its repetition, and of course, Dido's lament has has the the ground base as well has the has the descent, the um, but the descent it represents to me anyway, it's it's not just grief but it's relentless grief because it doesn't stop, and as Monteverdi said, the vocal part should be sung. Um, as the emotions dictate, not to the beat of the hand, which is wonderful advice for this kind of, um, of emotional state that you're trying to represent. Because if the accompaniment stays very, very steady, and the instruments are not tempted to go after the singer if the singer's doing something else, then that gives you as the performer the freedom to truly emote, to truly tell your story 
of loss and an angst because you're, you're almost like fighting this, this relentless, implacable accompaniment that will not stop. And, and also you have your backing singers too, the, the chorus that kind of comment on your grief. But what's wonderful is when you take it off the page, and this is what I say to my, my students all the time, you have to take it off the page and bring it into you because otherwise it's an academic exercise. It has to, st it has to have an emotional life. Um, so that's really, you know, that's a long way of saying that that's what, what my interest is, that's where my interests lie, in getting it off the page, in getting it into, not just into our voices, but into our, our psyches, into our hearts, into our emotions, and bringing this music in, into the now, finding ways to, to uh, represent this music authentically, but also in the present. So that, that's me. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I will be. I will speak very shortly because I haven't. I have been uh, contributing to this project mostly as a musician and not as a, not as a scholar. But since I've known Wendy for a long time, and we've every time we see each other, we discuss a lot of Cavalli and 17th century music. I was also very very um, excited about your. Um, wonderful presentation and uh, this morning uh, while preparing for this short um, thing I, I will tell you about I uh, something came to, uh, came to my mind uh, a source I read a few years ago that I wanted to share with you not with I mean just out of, curi out of curiosity it's a different sort of, of source it's not about music precisely but it does talk a bit about music it is also a letter a different type of letter and what you said about this tension between reality and fiction at some point really got me thinking. And I think this, uh, this short um, excerpt from one of the letters of Pietro della, Val della Valle, Pietro della Valle actually is listed in one of your, of, of your slides. Um, Pietro della Valle was this Roman nobleman who was a musician, a musicologist, and uh, an intellectual that is mostly remembered for his 12-year trip uh, traveling around the East, in, first in the, um, in the Holy Land and in North Africa and in Persia, even he got to India. And then after these two years, he comes back and starts uh, publishing his own letters, the Viaggi of Pietro della Valle, that are uh, written in the, in the form of, of letters. And in one of the letters, he... He starts his trip in 1614, and in one of his letters from Persia, he tells about a very curious episode. In the, he's at the court of the Shah, Abbas I, Abbas the Great, and he talks about, that, about the fact that in 1614, the son of the Shah, Safi Mirza, had been killed by his father because he was a suspect of rebellion. Um, which was actually not true. So uh, Pietro de, Val de la Valle says, I will just read my own very quick and very bad probably translation that I made this morning. Um, Since the king, so the Shah, knew that his son's death sentence wasn't fair, he feels so sad that every day he cries bitterly because of this. He has forbidden everyone to talk, write, sing, or compose verses about Safi Mirza so that his pain does not come back. The younger children of the prince are kept hidden in the harem because every time the king sees them, he cannot stop shedding tears upon them. I could tell much more about this sorrowful tragedy of which I know the reasons and circumstances. How heavily it is felt today by the regretful king and how the principal wife of the dead prince feels. In the aftermath of the prince's death, she went before the king, not only wrapped in black clothes, but almost undressed, almost naked, with her whole body dyed in black, screaming and insulting the king. Indeed, she did and still does crazy things. I also heard about a princess who was the sister of the dead prince, who also cries continuously with no comfort, 
In order to satiate her own anxiety, she often calls a group of female singers and asks them to sing and play sad and compassionate music in her presence. To the sound of this tearful music, she enjoys letting out her own pain with great weeping. So what Pietro della Valle is talking about is something that apparently is a real fact that took place in the in in around 1614, 1616. Um, of course, filtered by the lens of the genre of these letters that are not always so much um, realistic, maybe. But I, I thought that this um, tension that you were talking about between what is real and what is fiction, and also about the limits of these literary genres, um, was interesting to notice also in this kind of sources, and also by the also because of the fact that what she what he describes about the the behavior of this woman of these women is very much similar to what we found with Eugenio in the cantatas we've been working on. So this, this, uh, these women that during their laments they are um, hurting themselves, their, their own bodies. Um, so yes, basically that's it. So thank you. <laughs> My material voice is a little tired, excuse me. <laughs> so um, I'm a musicologist, and I just actually published my first book in November um, on voice, taking up actually a lot of these um, kinds of questions, but in the late 18th century. Um, so the classical reception, of course, has shifted quite a bit, um, and the focus is actually more on the figures of Orpheus and Sappho, who, of course, does appear in the Heroides, although she sort of seems to be written out of it um, in some of these later Renaissance iterations. Um, but <clears throat> my remarks today, which I've written down, because otherwise I will talk um, for a very long time, um, <laughs> my remarks today are some kind of a bridge between the work of that, of that first book, um, where I wrote about, among other things, voices as archives of cultural history, um, that the way that voices are mediated into text and also the way that they sound um, as inflected by the cultural movements um, that they make audible. Um, so it's a bridge between that and my new project. Um, where I'm thinking about how the different timescales of history and temporality as embodied experience intersect in moments of musical performance and listening. Um, so my focus is still, as always, on the performance culture of 18th century Italian opera. Um, but today I want to talk a little bit about um, how one writer, who's sort of one of my main interlocutors in this new project, and someone I know um, other people in this room, like Eugenio and Shane, have also written about, um, I want to talk about how she heard the voices of that performance culture of that 18th century Italian opera resonating across time into her own moment in the late 19th century. Um, and I think this is the same period that we'll be hearing some excerpts from um, the Parisotti um, sort of uh, remakes, editions of, yeah, arrangements of those um, arie antiche. Um, so I suggest here that this author's attempts to understand the effects of those voices in her own time and place, um, in many ways, Adam Bray, 21st century theories of performance, um, sort of theatrical performance, but also just performance as a set of embodied acts of listening, of historiography, and so forth. Um, all of these as inherently cross-temporal phenomena. Um, so in a 1933 monograph, not quite late 19th century, but we'll get there, um, in a 1933 monograph entitled Music and Its Lovers, the author Vernon Lee attempted to theorize how music elicits physiological and emotional responses from listeners. She explained this, quote, queer fact of music's entanglement with the human body by describing a phenomenon she dubbed affective memory. So this affective memory resides in what she called, quote, the ghosts of past movements. That is, as she puts it, the psychological residues or traces of past bodily experiences. One's hidden reservoir of past experiences, she claimed, can later, even in a different context, quote, gush out under the pressure of music, end quote. Um, so I'm clearly taking up the hauntings theme uh, from tonight's concert. Um, so Vernon Lee was actually the preferred name of Violet Paget, um, who was born in 1856 in France to British expat parents. Um, but she spent most of her life on the continent, especially in Italy, um, in the areas around Florence. 
Um, and as an enterprising teenager, so we're all a little bit far behind, as an enterprising teenager, she undertook what was then unprecedented archival research into the history of Settecento opera um, after falling in love sort of by happenstance with the poetry of Pietro Metastasio. Um, and this work later became her first monograph, Studies of the 18th Century in Italy. Um, so she's best known today, mostly among sort of literary theoretical types, uh, for having introduced the concept of Einfühlung, or empathy, into English language aesthetic thought. But her notion of empathy is actually quite curious, because um, it's not what we tend to think about as empathy today, right, as sort of feeling for another person. Um, rather, it was about theorizing the porousness between an individual and the object world that they inhabited. So this mode of empathy was actually an aesthetic experience. It was instigated by one's sensing the formal qualities of a beautiful visual or audible object, and then amplifying it through one's own accumulated bodily memories of similar past experiences. So particularly important in this empathic blurring between person and object world, was again what she called affective memory, those ghosts of past movements that reside in one's body. Um, and for those of you who um, are interested in performance studies, this is actually really strikingly similar uh, to Rebecca Schneider's theory of touching time in her book, Performing Remains. Um, but put simply, what Lee intended by empathy was this transhistorical affective experience of the beautiful, which for her felt like, quote, being companioned by the past, of being in a place warmed for our living by the lives of others, end quote. So why am I bringing all of this up? Partly because her own personal affective memories were overwhelmingly of singing voices, but crucially, voices she had never actually heard, but voices that had vanished with the flesh that housed them over a century prior. Um, Still, Lee imagined these voices, these operatic voices from the 18th century past, and conjured her own ghosts of past movements by listening to the arias that had been composed for those voices. So for one example, in the introduction to her studies of the 18th century in Italy, that, that monograph I just mentioned, she recounted how, as an adolescent, she received a longed-for packet of 18th century Italian arias. She knew, again, enterprising teenager, she knew even then that one of those arias, Pallido il Sole by Hassa, had been among those famously sung by the great castrato Farinelli to soothe the madness of the king of Spain. Surely, she thought, this aria retained some traces of that magical voice, the residues or the ghosts of the affective movements it had occasioned in its listeners a century earlier. But what if it didn't? She couldn't bear to be in the room when her mother first played and sang the aria. So she actually fled and hid herself in the gardens to listen through a window. Decades later, recounting this experience, she wrote, quote, I can still feel the sickening fear mingled with shame, lest the piece should turn out hideous. It is impossible to put into reasonable words the overwhelming sense that on that piece hung the fate of a world the only one which mattered, the world of my fancies and longings." So for Lee, voices both real and imagined could hybridize time by turning affective memory into a form of cross-temporal world-making. So perhaps then, coming back to the theme of this event, when new singers animate the notes, the words, and the affects of the past, their voices re render temporarily porous those boundaries between history and memory, or between the material and the spectral. So perhaps through these sedimented embodied acts of both performance and listening, the ghosts of past movements invite us to touch time and to reside, if only for a moment, in the world of our fancies and longings. Thank you. Great. Well, these have been really wonderful, and uh, I really love the emphasis on performance, especially in our last couple of um, interventions. I'm going to unfortunately go back to the page, <laughs> the academic page, um, but I hope it's an academic page that will be of little interest. So I teach mainly in Italian and, and comparative literature, and um, 
I just happened to be teaching one of my favorite, and I continue to be fascinated by this play after having read it many times over 30 years, Tasso Zaminta. It's one of the first pastoral plays of the 16th century um, by the great Renaissance writer of many things, including a long epic called the Jerusalem Liberata. Um, and in the second act of the Aminta, as you may know, there's a satyr who shows up um, who utters some pretty interesting lines regarding you know, these young boys, these tenarelli, um, who seem to get all the attention of young women, even though this isn't the case, as we know from the first act, where one of those tender young boys complains about Sylvia not loving him and wants to die. Uh, and the satyr also loves Sylvia. Um, but instead of wanting to die, um, in the middle of his lament, he says, perché in van Milano? You know, why am I lamenting in vain? I just have to take action and do what nature made me to do, which is to use violence, use force, um, in opposition to those tenarelli, who he says are femine nel sembiante, they look like women, they're very effeminate, they act effeminately. Um, I'm going to do what nature made me do, which is to um, far violenza, um, to use my forza, um, so to use violence, to use my force, and to try to uh, take Silvia by force if she doesn't agree. Um, I will seize and take what she denies me. Now, the irony is that the young boy, uh, Aminta, um, one of these tenarelli, um, actually ends up uh, freeing Silvia from the satyr's grasp um, and freeing her and therefore saving her from this violenza. And we never see the satyr again. But this, but this, but this, this question really intrigued me. Perché in van Milano? Why do I lament in vain? And it occurred to me rereading the Aminta for the hundredth time, how much lament in the Renaissance is, a, is, is gendered male. Um, how many men are lamenting? You know, Petrarch is the great lamenter of all time, and this, of course, continues um, in you know just thousands of other sonnets and canzoni and madrigals um, about lamenting men because these horrible women don't love them back. So, what's striking to me about the satyr in the Aminta, again, reading it for the hundredth time, especially thinking of the context of, uh, of the context that we have here tonight, is the extent to which the satyr is himself saying that lament is something more or less tied to these tenderelli, these effeminates who don't do anything, whereas he's going to do something um, and use force. Um, and I think that this notion of the effeminacy of the lament, in his words, um, only effeminate men are lamenting, um, then just reminded me of a phrase that Tasso will use some 15 years later in a dialogue I'm sure many of the people on the stage know, La Cavaletta. It's a dialogue about, among other things, modern music in the late 16th century. And Tasso's rather famous phrase from that dialogue is the extent to which you know modern music is a musica la shiva, right? It's, it's a music that he goes on to say is mole ed effeminata. It's a, it's a music that's, that's soft, it's, it's feminine, um, it's lascivious, it does all of these things that music shouldn't do. What music really should do, especially music that is put to the words that he, Tasso, writes, is to move us toward the magnificence, toward the constant, and toward the grave. Um, grave not as in the grave where we lie, but the grave is in the serious. Um, this is the kind of music that suits the lyre, and this is the kind of music that suits the very kind of epic poem that Tasso has been writing for his entire life and is in the process of, of rewriting. And he'll go on, I won't bore you with all these examples, but he goes on to say how you know, the great epic poets like Virgil, for example, um, write a poetry that lets us both see and hear, vedere e udire, and he talks about the extent to which so many of Virgilian examples involve sound. We hear the noise of the waves, the howling of the winds, the crashing of rocks, the strepito, or the clashing of weapons. These are all, I would say, kind of violent um, sounds. And so I want to kind of use this idea of Tasso's own rejection of the lascivious music, his endorsement of violent sound, uh, to be thinking about a heroine that we'll be hearing about in a little bit tonight. Her name is Armida. She happens to be from Tasso's epic, The Jerusalem Liberata. Um, and Armida, whose um, lament, as it were, went on to um, inspire more operas drawn from Tasso's great epic poem than any other episode in The Jerusalem Liberata. Um, it's a lament in which she definitely curses the man, Rinaldo, who she has lured to her island and then who, rescued by a couple of comrades, leaves her. Um, and in the parting lines of her lament, after he has taken off with his comrades, however somewhat unwillingly, uh, she basically says that even though she hates being queen and hates her life, she's going to swear herself as long as she lives to la dolce vendetta, to getting revenge. And sure enough, she jumps into her chariot, she goes back to Egypt, and she tries to organize all of these troops. You know, you know, she gets her favorite cavalieri, she said, I'll marry who, whichever one of you kills this damn guy, Rinaldo, who has left me behind. Um, the plot fails, as you probably know. So Rinaldo, the great warrior, ends up killing all these guys. He is able to, in the closing minutes of the Jerusalem Liberata, 
save Armida herself, who is so in such despair. No, none of the Egyptian army has succeeded in killing Rinaldo. She's about to kill herself, and he saves her. And she you know, falls in love again and converts to Catholicism. And the poem basically ends. So that's our Armida's lament. I want to move us really quickly, a century forward, uh, across the little tiny British Channel to Britain in the year 1699, and to a uh, librettist named John Dennis, who worked with a uh, musician named uh, John Eccles for a 1699 production of Rinaldo and Armida, very much based on Lully's French opera earlier in that century. Um, but Dennis has a different, uh, let's say, mandate from Lully and other, um, other, other, other writers of operas in this period. And his mandate is this. Um, he says, even Tasso erred in his initial portrayal of Armida. And as he says, and this is his little poem, that's the prologue to the opera itself, to descend to such enervated strains, the tragic muse with majesty disdains. He will proceed to give us a, 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 the great Torquato's heroine, she shall appear, i.e. Armida, nothing but proud, fierce, stormy, terribly severe, such as the Italian has Armida shown when by the world's disorder she'd revenge her own. And he goes on to say that as a proud and disdainful beauty, she has a tendency to be, quote, violent in her love, and especially her love for Rinaldo. Now, in the version of the story that uh, John Dennis is going to give us, Armida does not have a happy ending. And this really reminded me, Wendy, of so much of what you were saying, that there's a kind of container put around these early modern operas of these tragic heroines in antiquity, but all of a sudden they're saved and there's you know ambivalently happy ending, but it's a happy ending. Dennis refuses to give us the happy ending of Tasso and he gives us an ending instead in which the violence ultimately that Armida swears forever against um, her lover, Rinaldo, she turns against herself, uh, but in a way that it avoids the happy ending, it avoids the conversion, it avoids the lascivious music which we would have had to have heard had Rinaldo rescued her and saved her. So I guess my closing question is simply this. Um, we don't get a static contained space. Uh, this is not something Dennis wants, like Tasso. He's against effeminate, enervating music. But I want to ask, you know, does Armida therefore become a kind of satyr? Is this the way that we purge enervation and that we purge effeminacy? Uh, so like Tasso a century earlier, I'll just conclude, Dennis was concerned about the potentially dangerous impact on Englishmen of that, quote, soft and effeminate music, which abounds in the Italian opera where the whole man is dissolved in the wantonness of effeminate airs. So I'm just curious about the extent to which, A, you would agree with that <laughs> verdict of Italian opera, um, and secondly, the extent to which female characters lament uh, in the figure of Armida and other women can be seen as a corrective to this, emerging like Tasso's satyr, ready for violence, even if it's against herself. So thank you for this wonderful opportunity. And Thank you. So now we commence the, the W's. <laughs> Always at the end. <laughs> Plague bodies, an autoethnographic lament. While writing my book during quarantine with concerts canceled, my thoughts often turned to issues of identity, my own and that of my protagonist, the 17th century composer, Leonora Duarte, a Judeo-Portuguese immigrant forced to live as a converted Catholic in 17th century Antwerp. The walls of my apartment and a lifetime of things, books, music, instruments, photographs, my child's paintings, closed in around me and I mused. Almost nothing directly connected to Duarte survives. There is one surviving manuscript in Oxford at Christchurch College Library of her seven five-part sinfonias. And there is some testimony, a few letters, diary entries, pointing to her abilities as a singer and a composer. The project of constructing her life thus poses some fundamental archival challenges. And yet the project is valuable, I may even argue crucial. For one, Duarte inhabits some some musicological black holes. She was a woman composer in the early modern period, a subject about which we still sadly know so little. Secondly, she was a converso in the early modern period, and we know next to nothing about the cultural lives of the converted post-Inquisition Jews. But there is something else, and that is that nearly everything was pitted against her 
By nature of her religion and her gender, she was disallowed from working in the public sphere, and yet she succeeded in writing astonishing music, music that has, to use the words of Thomasine LeMay, been filtered down to us. Duarte was writing at a time in which a deeply ingrained culture of anti-Judaic sentiment reared its head afresh, a mere two generations after the Jewish expulsions from the Iberian Peninsula. And this positioned conversion, identity blending, and passing as normative. These complexities resonate with my own, at times, tangled identity as a somewhat secular New Yorker with Jewish roots, an identity that silently informs everything about my musicianship, from choosing repertoire to the way that I perform it and write about it. What a surprise it was to find through the course of my research that I am related to Leonora and my father's mother's side, a fact that gave voice to the fantasy of closeness to my protagonist and her multiple pasts, a connection that I grasped for in those uncertain times of isolation. Music functions for me as a means to emphasize these connections, and not just between present and past, but between nations and otherwise disparate cultural borders, social, religious, ethnic, and racial. Voices emerge with this kind of deeply personal autoethnography, auto and voices are resonating all around us all the, all the time. Some are locked behind unjust historical ignorance, some, as Emily Wilburn has shown, are there but rendered silent by gendered language. And still others have been forgotten amidst the shifting priorities of professional musicology. The questions I ask of myself are thus those I demand of my protagonist. How do women resist constraints? How can musicking work against dominant social structures? How does the practice of making music, and for that matter, writing about music, open up a particularly fertile space for resistance? There is a long history of famous women, powerful in their own time and place. Often this history is told against the backdrop of power determined by nations. We think a lot in early music, particularly in Baroque music, about the concept of nation and national style. But what of those not governed by nations or included within dictates of nationhood? Duarte's success as someone unrecognized due to her religion as a full citizen subverts the, na the notion of nationhood as a prerequisite for legitimacy. And yet the networks and the communities she forged by attracting visitors into her salon because of her musical abilities also challenge the old construct of the Jew as a wandering, nationless minority. So these kinds of histories are important, we can even argue foundational, and they're also half the narrative. And history sounds very different when it's revoiced, as it were. As a performer, I'm acutely aware of how the point of these convergences is in the body, a body subjected to identity claims made on it by others, a body that masters the physical properties and constraints of instruments, and a body that arbitrates over sound and its many potentials for meaning. By no accident of performance curatorship, my choice to perform Duarte when possible in spaces that are close approximations to her home or acoustics emulating rooms filled with paintings and art objects, the Kunstkammer, environments that resemble those in which Duarte made music, engenders a sonic and visual awareness of the way in which the body navigates the intersections of past and present, living and deceased, scored versus sounded music. Performance is, after all, a juxtaposition of musical cultures and social contexts occurring in the present. It is a drastic event that permits an emergence of coded information, or what Jonathan D'Souza has referred to as, quote, a process of bodily technicization that affects the ways that players perceive, understand, and imagine music, end quote. When the relevance of performance spaces that Duarte created is considered critically, social spaces that allowed men and women, Jews and non-Jews, to freely associate where they otherwise would not have been able, 
we can chart, to paraphrase Suzanne Cusick, specifically feminized priorities within music history. And these spaces are integral to music's mobility and development. In 1678, Leonora died likely of the plague, along with her sisters and fellow musicians. No inventory of their home with its many objects survives but an audible and living music history can adjust its ears to continue to hear her voice. I also am a musicologist and I have a W last name, so we're here. <laughs> At, at the end of this epic round table. <laughs> oh, what, one of the questions that Daniel sent us in preparation for this event was to think about how performance helps us to hear the voices of the past. And the question struck me as a very rich one, particularly in the context of lament, because when we think about the voices of the past, we often think of them as the ones we're trying to recapture, right, are the authentic, expressive voices of the people of the past. When we say that we want to recapture somebody's voice, it's, it's because we want to understand the truth of them, their actual self, their embodiment, their lived experience of the world. And this idea of voice is thus connected to concepts of agency and of authenticity. And I think that the performed lament allows us to think very carefully about precisely that kind of crux of identity. Because in the performed lament, the person who is performing, particularly in these professional spaces, the kinds of virtuosic music that were required in the, in the concert of uh, the private court and also in the public opera house is a kind of incredible control over one's voice that actually isn't possible when you're lamenting. If you're actually upset, can you perform Ariana's lament? Probably not. If you could effectively perform Ariana's lament, then the authenticity of your own sorrow comes immediately into question. So thinking about this thought, I was reminded of a passage in Suzanne Cusick's really excellent book about Francesca Caccini, where she talked about Francesca Caccini organizing the funeral for her husband, uh, Johnny Battista, and I looked that passage up. So Signorini was the name of her husband. So this is a paragraph from uh, Suzanne Cusick's book. Oh my God, Suzanne just texted me. She said, may I ask an ignorant professional question? Not right now. <laughs> Timing is everything. So this, this is Suzanne's words. Francesca's first obligation as a widow was to organize her husband's funeral. In keeping with Florentine customs, Signorini was buried the day after he died in the tomb kept by his burial society, the Compagnia di Santo Rosario della Glori Gloriosissima Vergine Maria in Santa Maria Novella, probably acting via instructions to her household servants or possibly to male relatives. Francesca must have arranged for professionals known as beccamorti to bathe, shave, and dress Signorini's body for burial and carry it to a buyer that they would have prepared in her home's main room. She also would have sent someone to notify the clergy at Santa Maria Novella, who would send a delegation of priests and friars to intone the seven penitential psalms from one side of the buyer. Francesca would have cut her hair to signify her renunciation of sexuality, donned mourning clothes appropriate to her social rank, and led the ritual lamenting by Signorini's female relatives and women friends. No elegantly improvised lament on the death of an imaginary Adonis, the morning song Francesca and the other women were likely to have improvised for her handsome husband was meant to sound disorganized. Rising from the benches on one side of the room to which all women mourners were confined, 
Its ritual sonic disorder was to emphasize in sound as well as space the sexual segregation that was a crucial element of Florentine funerary rites. So here we have a woman who was a singer, a professional singer, a composer in her own right who had composed several laments, whose husband dies and who is sitting in a room confined to one side of the room along with female members of her husband's family who were also many of them professional singers and friends of the family, probably including most of the professional singers from the Florentine court, improvising laments that were not supposed to sound completely professional. And it struck me as, as a moment in which we could really think about authenticity, about expression, and also about the way in which female laments in opera are often thought of as responses to love, to the loss of love, to a denial of love, to being betrayed, used, abandoned, often left on a shore, a, a very strategically spatial representation of boundaries. Um, because one of the things that women were expected to do once their husband died, if they were still of a marriageable age, they were expected to remarry within a, a couple of months. And they basically had several choices. And Cusick lists them in her book. She said that Francesca basically had three choices. She could stay living in the family of her husband under that family's control and raise her children. She could leave and get remarried which legally meant she had to leave the children with the husband's family, or she could try and gain guardianship of the children and her own household and be able to raise the children herself without getting remarried, which is what she attempted to do. And then Cusick traces like a number of letters in which Caccini attempts, Francesca Caccini attempts to like claim some agency in the negotiation over her future, and it's not always clear whether she has any of that moment. And in that moment, that lament is also a political lament, and many of the women in operas have acted outside of matrimony, like Ariana betrays her family in order to go off with Tessio, and she has slept with him. She does not have a political future. She do, it's not like a heartbreak today where you may feel like nothing good is ever going to happen in the world, but actually you still have your house, you still have your family, you still have all of the things that you had. And these laments happen at these moments in which circumstance has intervened in the stable situation of a woman and she is facing a moment where she does not know what her future is going to be. And that made me think, Ariana's lament is one that I've thought about a lot, but made me think of that moment where she's like, great, Baco, I'm all in, right? <laughs> she has just lost everything. And she laments, and Bacchus turns up and says, contrary to all political whatever, I see you as a person who's worth something. Let's get married. And she's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's get married. Right? And she suddenly has a future again in a completely political way. And it made me start thinking about how we might hear these songs, which are love songs. They're about this sexually betrayed, abandoned woman who manages sometimes to get the lieto fine. And how amazing that lieto fine must have seemed like a shimmering mirage to the women in the audience, right? Not just the sadness of it, but that the woman has managed to be unique enough to have a future beyond that point, that they get some future forward, place that they could be after 
that moment. That's it. <laughs> We do have a couple of mics. Um, one is there and one is on the harpsichord, so we might want to keep them at hand. Uh, well, thank you so much. Uh, I mean, I really feel like a kid in a candy shop with all these great ideas uh, and thoughts. I mean, of course, I mean, we do have some 10 minutes or so for maybe some um, further quick thoughts, because then we have to empty the room for getting it ready for the concert. Um, and also the aperitivo will be waiting for us upstairs. So, um, but I think, you know, really uh, what sort of strikes me is that from all these various perspectives, um, what we really get here is a fantastic entanglement of this paradoxical situation, which I find so fascinating when I think about the lament, which is the fact that on the one hand, we have the real experience of it uh, in its many forms, um, in real life, so to speak, even though we do know that, especially when it gets ritual, it's not natural anymore, or at least not entirely natural anymore. But then on the other hand, we have the question of how, re how to reenact this thing on stage. Um, and the question of the broader frame for the lament, um, as Emily was uh, telling us, of course, uh, is extremely important. Something which I'm particularly interested in, and uh, maybe this is a kind of a question for everybody, really sort of going back to what Wendy was telling us about the sort of osmosis, the sort of porous, uh, uh, boundaries between genres, right? Because of course the heroides are um, love letters, um, but then at times they get into a broader frame of an opera where we have a narrative development, often with a happy ending, not necessarily but often, as is the case with Arianna in the original opera by Monteverdi. But then what happens there is that, as we all know, the opera Arianna is lost, but the lament survives, and the lament begins to travel on its own, without the happy ending. And that seems to be the winning card in a way because all the, most of the imitations of the lament, and we will hear some tonight, uh, tend to really get rid of the finale, right? I mean, we have this situation of crisis which is not resolved. Um, and it sort of leaves the room open for possible developments. And that's maybe where all, I mean, some of the questions which we have discussed get, get together. Another point which I think is fairly uh, uh, critical here uh, is the question of the uh, embodied experience, um, uh, be it the experience of a composer who's also a singer or of a contemporary performer who's also a composer or even of scholars who read about these materials and they also sort of feel the charm of these um, ancient past past voices, but everything is inevitably material, right? So uh, uh, I think these kind, of, these kind of questions are really uh, uh, extremely interesting to me. So uh, we do have time for a, a, some sort of, you know, uh, either quick replies on the stage um, or some, you know, burning questions from, from the audience. Um, so let's just keep the flow going. Just while it's in my head, uh, I had a question for Wendy, which I won't ask, or maybe I'll ask later, but um, to those last comments, um, I, I couldn't help thinking, um, you know, for me, I often meditate on what is kind of the, the ur text of Lament, which is Orpheus's head floating down the river Hebrus um, as he cries out in Virgil, Eurydice, but in Ovid, uh, doesn't say anything that's articulate, right? He just utters this flebole nesquioquid, that's the Latin. Nesquioquid means something or other, I don't know what. I mean, like, that's to over-translate it. And the flebole is something weepy, right? And the trouble is that flebole, like, what is something weepy? We don't have a word really like flebole, able, able to be wept at. Um, but you could compare pitiful, right? So to sing something pitiful, do you have to feel pity? No, if you sing something pitiful, the pity is supposed to, people are supposed to be full of pity or in the audience, right? So Orpheus's fleble nesquioquid, which may not even have been a sound produced by a living body, after all, he's just been decapitated, you know, he's floating down the river, um, but a sound is coming and if you heard it, you would cry, right? And so that, strain, that ineffable agency of lament is actually, you know, one could argue hardwired right there, you know, into the whole tradition in, you know, where, wh where is the feeling there? Um, we know it's in the audience, but where it comes from, you know, is really hard to say. So that was, you really made me think of that. Thanks. 
That was so much fun. It was just wonderful to hear you all. Um, I was thinking first about Castiglione to go back to the very beginning, and this sort of the notion, and it came up in what in what Emily was saying, sort of the split between the performer psyche and the role that you're performing. You know, so if I'm performing Ariana and I'm upset, I might have trouble. If I'm singing a funeral, I might feel differently because I'm channeling. And so there are all these different ways in which a split happens. And what I loved about, about your example is this idea that, um, that somehow the character, the, the fictional character wouldn't be moved by it. But if they heard the performance of, you know, then it was all, then it was gonna work. And that same phenomenon, the exact same thing happens um, with the reports of Anno Renzi singing in, um, in, in 1642, where I think the comment is something like, you know, you know, Nero wasn't moved by Octavia, but if he had heard Anna Renzi, his heart would not, would, right. I mean, and, and it's the same thing. But that, that, that just made me think about what that split is and how so much of that embodied experience of the performer, and I can talk about this literary genre and this influence that, but once that singer is up there, it is that persona of the singer that often takes over and inhabits, you know, it's, it's Joyce DiDonato singing Ariana or singing, I mean, I mean, there's this thing that happens and that's somehow part of that embodied experience that I think is so, and that also creates these splits in reality, right? So there's the reality of the myth and there's the myth that's being broken or changed and then there's the reality of the singer that's embodied. I mean, there's just so much weird impersonation when one voice takes over the other. And I don't know that this is a question. It's just something that seemed to come out of thinking about, you know, even your letter, Andre, so, you know, just about what some of those issues are, or even the satyr not being the same. You know, there are all these ways in which we've got so many layers of impersonation, and somehow voice and performer brings that to the fore. So, I don't know. Not a question, but <laughs> a thought. I think one of the reasons why this project can be, you know, very fruitful is that it allows us to posit the general question, what's the difference between lament inside a dramatic or narrative structure and lament as reperformed as isolated song? So that's something that, you know, where people doing performance uh, will have a lot of contribute about the emotions of performers and audience uh, how they change, whether there is a larger frame or a reperformance. And that's one reason why Wendy's choice of Heroides was also interesting, because there we have some kind of blur between uh, the, the isolated, the repeated, and, and the larger context. So it, it's just, you know, a question for, uh, for the future. I was just going to say that that the the idea that performing lament as a form of impersonation, I think, was was the term. And yes, absolutely. No matter how much you, as a performer, embrace the character, embrace the music, uh, you do your research, you you become the character. You never are actually the character. And of course, actual lamenting, as as we've been saying. The, the the keening. I'm Irish, right? So you know we we know a bit about that too. Um, we we have to um, perform symbolic laments um, when in, in the Irish tradition using the you know, the shando sort of, um, ornamentation to imitate the sound of crying. But of course, actual crying. It's impossible. To, it's not impossible to cry and sing. We've all done it. We've all been overtaken by our emotions on stage occasionally when we sing something that means a lot to us. And that sometimes has got nothing to do with the actual piece, but it, we're bringing, you know, memories and emotions into it. And, you know, you keep going and then you, you, you the, the sound changes and the performer changes. And, but the thing that you always have to remember, I always remember my, my, my voice teacher when I was younger, who was rather mean, actually, he was, he was a bit strict. And, and he said, you have to make the audience cry. If you cry, then you, you failed. <laughs> 
you've just failed as a performer because you have to have a certain amount of disconnect from what you're doing in order to connect with the audience. And so there's that, you know, just you were talking about the different layers of performance. There is that element ultimately that you need a little bit at least you to to have that little step back in order to to make your audience cry. But it's it's a tough one. Um, just to say something about um, what you were talking about, this sort of idea that um, as a performer, one must be sort of distant from, but also embedded within this persona. It's, it's, it, it, this became actually a big topic of debate in the mid 18th century, especially among um, Diderot himself, like literally debating with himself, and that um, Denis Diderot, who published first this sort of treatise about how you know the great actor had to truly feel what it was he was going to portray, because that is how you elicit feeling from the people in the audience. And then he actually had this uh, experience which he found to be deeply uncanny of watching the great Shakespearean actor David Garrick perform this weird party trick. Um, so David Garrick is sort of famous for bringing um, Shakespeare back to the London stage in the mid 18th century and never breaking character. Um, so he would uh, refuse to acknowledge applause, he would stay in character even when he wasn't speaking, etc. cetera. And um, so Diderot saw this party trick by David Garrick where he would just sort of like stick his head out and you know represent some emotion in his face and then disappear and then do a different emotion. And he was doing these in rapid succession, this sort of astonishing representation of going through all these emotions. And Diderot was like, yeah, okay, so you definitely don't need to feel what it is that you're representing in order to do it. And then he wrote um, The Paradox of the Actor, um, which is in many ways, it was published posthumously, but it's sort of in many ways his final word on this, where he's basically like, yeah, so actually acting is deeply creepy uh, because it's essentially an actor crawling inside a big wicker model and then moving their arms and legs and it's like a ghost and it's all very, I'm not doing a good job of summarizing it, but, <laughs> but essentially he did this about face by realizing that feeling something, you had to know what that feeling felt like, but in the moment you had to be absolutely cold and detached and that that was actually the way to elicit feeling from the people watching you because otherwise you would break character. Um, and he was himself deeply unsettled by this um, and he was sort of, he stood by it, but it, it in many ways um, it was quite an uncanny realization for him. And I think that this is one of the odd things to think about with, for those of us who are singers or sort of erstwhile singers or write about singers um, is this desire to sort of elide the two and yet that realization that there is sort of this uh, something inside that like wicker um, figure that is animating it in ways that both make us feel and then turn around and make us question why it is we're feeling and what it is that is eliciting this feeling from us in ways that are both sort of um, thought provoking and potentially um, kind of uncanny. So there you go. Thank you. I mean, in the interest of time, I think that we might need to uh, wrap things up now. So I would like to thank again Wendy Heller and uh, um, our fantastic speakers in the round table.